Yeah, there we go. Good evening, guys. Um, Sunday Night Strategy Podcast for Tortoise Capital, August 2nd, 2020. So just as a reminder to get us going, uh, when we talk about the trading process, these are the questions that systematically walk us through the trade geometry, the trade architecture. And so when we propose to frame a trade, this is the sequence we go through. What do I see? Not what I think about it, not trying to make any sense out of it yet, but just documenting the facts and the readings of the different measurements and the indicators, you know, height, length, and width, volume, weight, with a calibrated instrument. And from there, we then say, now, what could it reasonably do? Well, it could go up, it could go down, it could go sideways. And how would we distinguish between those? And uh, how far could it reasonably go? And when we say reasonably, it means in what period of time against what benchmark? If we're just looking at yesterday's high, as the limit of where it could reasonably go, we may not be looking back far enough. Um, if we're looking at a 10-year high, we may be looking back too far. It may not be able to get there in the time frame that we're proposing. So the kind of a frame, the kind of a trade that we're developing also matters. A 10-year high might be sensible if I'm thinking about holding a position for, you know, 3 to 12 months. Um, yesterday's high might be useful if I was thinking about one-minute charts. And so we can't rule out how far to look back unless we represent that in the context of the type of a trade that we're seeking to make how long does it have to be good for and therefore what kind of information do I have to bring into it if I'm going to go walk outside and it's August 1st August 2nd in Kansas I may not need to look at the 12 month low temperature because there's not a reasonable possibility that it's going to go to minus 20 today could happen, yeah, but it won't. Um, but if I was packing a bag for a six-month trip uh, to Michigan, well, then I would have to take into account that longer proposed holding period and plan my baggage and luggage accordingly to account for a wider set of environmental conditions. So when we talk about the trade process, what could it do, then we're really talking about how long we propose to hold it, what is the context within which it is reasonable. Which way would I want to trade? Which way would I trade? And that's two different questions. Which way I want to trade suggests I might have a bias, and which way do am I do I feel an emotional urgency to go? If you notice that, you should write that down. Is that representative of a herd mentality and an instinct, instinctive response? Or was that the trained pattern recognition of an expert trader? Heck, I don't know. Um, the longer I trade, the more often I see myself incorporating beginners' habits and minds and beginner patterns maybe because I'm conditioned into trading against that. But those things are all in there, and it's only after reflection and a full framing process that I can even distinguish what I think about that first instinctive response. And, and let me talk about that as a, uh, uh, on a continuum while we're here. Get that little 
my little sketch pad. Well, I was doing pretty good. I actually got one, you know, one screen in before I started drawing pictures. Where is that darn thing? There it is. You know, even when I look at the, some of these sketches after a day or so later, I wonder what in the world were we talking about? Let's see, I'm trying to remember what we were actually trying to remember what we were just talking about. Had a good thought in mind. So let's suppose that um, um, we have this environment that we're in, right? So that's really gonna, it's really gonna be the whole, this whole environment here. And there's some period of, there's some period of time. So this is the environment at T zero right now and then there's some measured increment of time so out here at t1 2 3 4 etc so each one of these snapshots you know if you put it together it starts looking like a movie but when we freeze frame and we're going to take a look at the environment, try to figure out what's going on right now, we are really stopping the action to see what's going on. And we're going to take that actual living, breathing dynamic, and we're going to realize that we're just one little actor inside of this, that there's a lot of little things going on in here. There are, there are, uh, actors, forces, structures, events, forces, whatever. And every action, if I take an action A, let me put that over here. If I take an action A, that's going to set up a little wave of change that goes out and starts affecting, you know, everybody around me. And then those actors are going to receive that wave of change. And then they're going to do something, and that's going to set up waves of change. So we have this rich interplay uh, of dynamic things going on even while we're just sitting here thinking about it and talking about it we are representing it as if it's a static snapshot but we got to remember there is an underlying dynamic going on in there and that while we think about it maybe in terms of this one snapshot that's in our head <coughs> excuse me we're constructing some mental framework of what's going on in order to make, uh, to ask questions about it, to have insights, and then to take action on it. So we're creating this, this mental model of the world. And all of these, or some of these things that we're aware of, are all represented in here in some way. 
and maybe we're accurate, maybe we're not. But there's always going to be some level of detail that we're going to be able to get to from our head. I'm going to include this much detail, but not any of this stuff down here. Where do we, where do we draw that line and how complex is that model and so forth? So we make that representation of the world. And then on the basis of that, uh, you know, we, we may make some decisions. Um, and then from that, you know, we're going to take action in the world because we think on net that's going to give us an improved position in the next sequence of time. And so we act on it, we put it into play, and then, you know, it inter it interacts with all of these things going on and whatever, and then we get some kind of result. And then that result, plus all of the results of all the little actions and all of these little participants and things are going on, all of those things are feeding into this, even things that we're not aware of. Uh, all of those things are coming in to the point where it's now useful for us to say, let me check and see what's going on now. So how fast are you making that, that decision? How much time in your frame of reference does that make? Now, one of the things that we unconsciously think about or assume is true is that whatever time frame we've assigned to T to T plus one, that that interval uh, is kind of what everybody else in here, the people who, who have choice, who can choose between courses of action. You know, forces and structures and events and all that are just kind of happening. But actors have real choices. And because we've chosen this interval from T0 to T1, let's call it one day, that we think all of the activity from one day is going to roll forward. And then now a series of daily snapshots is going to give us this movement forward, our little movie of what's going on, and we're thinking that there's connectivity in between them. Uh, but what if in this time frame there's guys that are working on hourly charts or 10-minute charts or one-second charts or uh, ticks, or if there's some guy operating on a weekly, and this is just one, one data point for him. So we end up making this kind of, uh, this choice about where to operate in order to, to build our snapshot of what's going on in order to come up with plans to lead to those actions. And it's very easy to forget that these actors in here are all operating in multiple time frames. In fact, we might be operating in multiple time frames. We might have some portion of us that are core uh, or swing or day, you know, scalping versus that long-term uh, position, position trading. So we're making simplifying assumptions all the time when we propose um, to draw this frame and to choose this time period. So let's always remember that this model of the world is just that. It's a, it's a simplification so that we can imagine what it's going to look like in these future states. Maybe there's more than one. Maybe we think there's momentum and we think it's going to unfold in a certain way. But we're, we're simplifying in order to run some simulations in our head and, and explore these, you know, course of action one and two and three, three different things that I might do. And I might imagine what each one of those is going to do looking forward. And then on the basis of that, come up with some plan for how I'm going to act. So you can see that there is a series of approximations and assumptions going on about how all that stuff works. Well, let's, put, let's fast forward, and now we say uh, we now are an enlightened being, and now we're going to study those results, and we're going to feed that back into the brain 
in the experience base of this little guy. So our little picture of ourself at T plus one is different that we've got an extra set of experiences. So we start getting this knowledge base of our experiences and then we have something like a model base which is sort of an abstraction of that that says in this world in which we operate based on this knowledge and our experience we think that the way we constructed this model over here is useful because the results it gave us were excellent and so that reinforces the, all the processes and the procedures that we go through so we end up getting maybe the SSC pattern and then the SFC pattern, and then the SWC pattern, and then the hybrid frog, and then the owl, and then the, uh, you know, some, some swing trades that operate on some of those, and then some core trades. And now pretty soon we have this, this set of patterns that are a relationship between the frame that we construct and then the choices that we think we have on the basis of, oh, I see this condition X happening over here, this sum total of things that looks like, um, ah, that looks like this pattern, and now I can play this one, and I bring that play, and now I've got some cognitive simplification because I can match the appropriate pattern to the environment as I detect it. And so as a result, our knowledge base of applied experience going forward increases. So what I'm concerned about is the way in which we turn those results and the lessons that we've learned from our reflection into reliable knowledge bases and model bases and patterns and how much confidence that we can have going forward. How much, how similar is this situation here at T plus one to this environment that we saw at T plus zero. The way that we sense and describe and summarize and this synthesize, the way we model and the choices that we see that we have, and then the way that we treat the results and learn from those results in order to update our knowledge base. All of those things are based on the proposition that there's some continuity between before, during, and after, and that we can learn, and that there is some persistence in the environment, that the power of the status quo keeps things working together. So I'm having this conversation with you right now because hopefully Catherine's in here. Uh, Catherine's about eight weeks not in here yet, but she, she'll listen to this. She's in into this about eight weeks, and uh, her um, expectancy curve is slowing down, starting to flatten out, and things that felt easy are no longer as easy. And so, you know, she's done a very nice job of being a self-directed learner and taking responsibility for her next sets of actions instead of just, you know, giving up the ship. Um, let's see. Let's see if it is. I, I want to talk about this now in terms of coachability, and and I want to say that the uh, the things I'm, I'm going to talk about now are uh, related to self-directed coaching and self-managing, and not so much direct trading, but this is in general support. Of trading. So this is where co that coach and player um, relationship um, really starts to matter. So what I want is to have a coach and I want to have a player and I want the coach to give good insights and I want the player to give insights to make the coach better and to make the player better. But this is all kind of contingent on there's all this knowledge about the game you know, how it's played, the rules and the experiences, you know, rules, you know, patterns, principles, etc. All of those things form that knowledge base about the game that the player is playing, the coach is coaching about, and so we get this experiential learning that's really powerful. 
And as long as the game is relatively stable, then the things that we did in the past still ought to carry forward. What We're making some assumptions then about what happens when you have a lot of VUCA in the environment. So now volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, if that's changing the nature of the game. So that makes you wonder, is it? And then what can we do about it? And how would you know? And how can you be adaptive? So it's not enough just to keep trading the same old patterns. If the same old patterns that you have are all working in the world at T0, and that's all good to go, at T sub N, at some point in the future, maybe those things aren't working anymore. And maybe I need, uh, maybe I need some new patterns. Which ones do I discard? So there's a certain power in, in the, so if you have the world, and let's say that we can understand enough of it so that we can create a, um, a status quo set of rules. And in this region, everything we're doing is good. That's the, that's the status quo. There's some region out here beyond the limits of our status quo, but now in the new world, where new and adaptive ideas could now be valuable. Whereas some of the old status quo things that we had may not be good anymore. And why? Because the world is changing and is moving on. There's still some amount of it in here that's still valid. So what do I drop? So if I have some kind of body of knowledge like this, what do I drop? What do I keep? What do I increase? I should do more of this thing that used to be new. What should I add? What should I study? And where should I be searching and researching? And how wide do I look? Why did I draw the boundary here? Was there anything over here? How do I know that those areas are not also good? Maybe I should be expanding my search. So as we're updating our professional body of knowledge, we want to we want to have some respect for the status quo because it was pretty good for a long period of time. But there's sometimes that we got to we got to be concerned with all of these things, how to manage. Manage our learning. And if the rate of change. Up here on the world at this at this cutting edge. that rate of change tells us how much we should prioritize our existing rules versus how much we should be looking at, at new ideas. So one of the things that now Catherine's got to take a look at is she now has eight weeks of data, about 200 trades, and she has some performance curves and whatever, and she has lots of statistics and a trade log and she has uh, uh, marked up trades in her trading journal, where you know she did uh, she did some entries. You know she did some kind of entry and it went up, and she had some kind of exit, and she captured some little piece, and so now she's got a uh, she has to study those for lessons learned and figure out what's going on, and then from that her assessment phase is really helping her with all of these decisions up here. And you have to recognize that this is a continuous process uh, of development. So here's some things that we do know. Uh, 
some ideas from the world. This is in the nature of coffee talk for you. That every time that we think we see an opportunity, it's because we recognize that there is some amount of reward that's available, and maybe we can account for the danger of it, you know, the risk. And so if I see a, a, a manageable, uh, if I can use my management techniques in here to safely get across that chasm, and I can avoid the danger. The problem is, how do I avoid the danger? The answer is the scaffolding and risk management and safety nets, and then probably also uh, this plan, prepare, execute, assess, and then the long-term plan to learn from that. You know, I've got some... Um, I've got some long-term learning strategy. All of those things allow me to stay in the game and to keep working. Um, and we come into that, we come into that with our background as a trader at some point, education, experience, habits, rules, patterns, tools, intuition, creativity, critical thinking, risk tolerance, all of those things that we take in there. And so we're studying this. And we're framing it as an opportunity. I might just also add that while we're here, uh, we should also be looking at how certain am I in my initial assessment? Is there are these shoulders really stable? You know, on either side of this chasm, when I because I'm going to build this bridge to get over there, do I have a belief in the sturdy foundation in there? That's what I mean about the support and the bracing that has to go into confirming that this is a usable opportunity. Like if that bank crumbles and I start building a bridge and it crumbles, then I then then I misjudge the total environment. So I gotta take a look at a deeper level of this thing. Well one of the things that we can look at is where you are in your skill development from novice to beginner to to some degree of confidence and proficiency up to expertise. And, you know, uh, at some point you're being taught, you're a student being taught by a teacher. And the idea is that we want to increase your expert for doing things, your expertise for doing things. And uh, there is some expertise that the teacher needs to have needed to teach you to start accelerating your progression through this pathway to expertise because the argument is that we can that teaching makes a difference this expertise for doing is what matters the most in my view um, because that's where you become self-reliant at some point I want you to have the skills of a teacher in order to help your own self-development but what we would what we would reinforce is that the intuition of an expert is different than random guessing. It's really a function of internalized reflective learning. And it is adaptive experiential learning. So that as we go through each of those accumulated cases that we're building, not these are not just one-off things that just happened. No, this is an accumulated body of knowledge and then your ability to reflect on it and do your own thinking and see what works for you. Now is how you start progressing up that stack from novice to beginner, competency, proficiency, and expertise. So, you know, hat tip to uh, the Dreyfus brothers and their model of skill acquisition. And there's a learning theory out there called gradual release of responsibility model, which shapes how I teach, which is how quickly can we get the responsibility for the education from the teacher over to the student so that the student can become proficient. The reason that matters, the reason that what the student knows matters the most, not what the teacher is, is because there's a certain phenomenon that happens to people who teach. From the world of um, 
paramedics. There's, a, there's some studies that were shown that when you, you get a teacher and you have them observe the behavior of the paramedics in action in a case study, and they're asked to distinct to characterize, was that person a novice or an expert on the basis of what they did and what you see? It turns out that teachers reliably incorrectly identify the difference between a novice and an expert in the world of paramedics. And I said, I think that's a, that's a skill where there's judgment in short periods of time and pattern matching. And I think it's applicable in a, in a general way to what we're doing. That why is it that the teachers can teach novices and get them up to expertise, but when they watch them in the field, they can't distinguish between experts and novices, or they actually mischaracterize it. And here's what that, that study suggests, that what we're really doing is that we're watching the responses. We're actually watching the responses of novices and experts to the needs of the situation. And what experts care about, care about are the results that occur. And so they're tapping into that reflective learning, that accumulated intuitive knowledge in order to check what to do against their, their, deep, their deep knowledge. The teachers who are watching this are remembering the rules that they teach. Well, why do they teach that way about the rules? And why are they looking for rules-based behavior? You know, are you doing what I taught you to do? Well, it's because from that vast world of experience, over time, people that have worked in it enough end up building that body of knowledge about what works. And that gets refined into rules, and that gets refined into principles, and then those become the basis for the lessons that the teacher teaches. So when the teacher is teaching the student, they're looking for compliance with the principles and the lessons and the rules that they taught. And so when you take them out into the field and you ask them to watch these guys go in, the novice or the expert, they don't know which one's which, but we want you to observe these guys responding to that situation what they are looking for by default, unless they're really self-aware, is which one of those groups is closer to the rules and the principles and the procedures that I teach them in the classroom? I teach them in a certain way so they can rapidly start moving up the scale of expertise. So it would be a natural thing for them to look for what behaviors do I see in evidence, in physical activity, that look like the rules that I teach. Whereas the experts were actually, what we know that experts do is as they move up this progression, the expertise for doing allows them to develop that knowledge base of patterns and habits and contextual knowledge. In fact, that's what Dr. Norman Herr talks about, what distinguishes experts from novices. He says, well, the experts, unlike the novices, have organized and recognized meaningful patterns of call and response, meaningful patterns of knowledge. And they have lots of organized content knowledge, and they do it around chunks or core ideas. And that experts, far more than novices, take into account the local context and the circumstances of that particular situation. And they are able to flexibly retrieve from that vast array of knowledge that they have things that are situationally important. So in other words, they can look deeply into that situation, figure out what makes that special, and then go to all of those, those patterns and chunks and, and sophisticated deep knowledge that is very well organized and pull forward just what they need to be able to apply it into the particular situation. 
And so their response, the further up this scale of expertise they go, where they have added to their to the expertise for their doing, which is going to be different than the teacher necessarily teaches, that their response is going to look different from the rules-based behavior that the teacher is unconsciously looking for. And so the teacher thinks, well, the novice, that person was following the rules just as I teach, and they must have really learned those lessons and become expert. And they say, oh, that guy over there that is doing maybe taking shortcuts or doing things out of sequence, that looks like unskilled behavior. And so the paradox of teaching is that in the classroom, the way the teacher is teaching it can make an awful lot of sense to rapidly accelerate the student into this acquisition of content knowledge, but without the experiential learning yet. And so um, what you do in the classroom for content and pedagogy might be different, is probably different from the expertise that it takes in order to be able to respond in short periods of time when uh, there's a lot of risk. And that's really the difference between novices and experts is that they are situationally aware, contextually aware, circumstantially aware, and they have a vast body of internalized experience to draw upon to help them make rapid decisions that are better than just random guessing. That that intuition is built on the many, many, many repetitions. And so that's why in the course, when we talk about uh, trading as a craft-based knowledge or skill-based knowledge, that's where that the testimony of um, uh, Alex and, uh, and Kim Say, so, hey, it was around 600 or to 800 trades. Something really had clicked by that time that they'd seen enough patterns, and that when they were applying the principles of this ruthless risk management as a safety net, it protected them from having psychological problems of heat and uncertainty, and it kept them certainly out of the danger um, from overexposure or uh, overconfidence, that that safety net of risk management combined with the scaffolding techniques was the general support, the intuitions that had been acquired over many hundreds of trades. And then that allowed them to use the scaffolding techniques of plan, prepare, execute, and assess, and answering all those questions of the uh, of the trade framing process is what allows you to survive and to operate in a routine professional manner so that you can actually acquire the data and then do the assessment and learning so that you can build robust systems that fit you so that you can achieve goals, objectives, dreams, and plans. So all of this stuff is tied together in the way that uh, I am responding to Catherine because you will recall last week she said that trigger phrase, oh, God, this was a tough week. Anybody else feeling that way? And then with her that long, you know, nut roll of uh, explaining why that's, the, that's an emotions-based response as opposed to this kind of a professional craftsman's approach. So one of the things that I would just – that, that I, I just sent to her was, look, you got to remember that that problem and the danger is always there and that what you're really doing is going through an update of all of these preconditions that go into allowing you to see the opportunity that you think is there for that reward based on the manage, manageability of the danger. Are your tools and patterns and techniques good enough to allow you to achieve those rewards while simply just managing problems and staying out of danger. And so one of the things that will that can happen on this pathway from novice to beginner to all the way up to expert is, you know, uh, I don't I want to call it lack of will, but the, the resilience and learning to suffer and learning really how to use the tools of data and assessment and then learning so that you can make the micro adjustments to pretty good scaffolding and techniques 
and then just realized that the world was changing enough that maybe when she first started in the first month, it was uh, it was easier in the first month because we were getting larger moves and all in the same kind of direction. And now the market is changing a little bit in these last few weeks as the techs have become fully valued and maybe beyond and the market is saturated with gains and now the mentality is shifting towards um, no longer rewarding the same behaviors that were being rewarded in the first month. So as we go through that this little process of deciding uh, what to drop, um, what to keep, what to increase and what to add, those decisions are needed because there is some rate of change happening in the world from the current moment to some future moment. So we've got to learn how to adapt so that our body of knowledge is stable enough to allow us to exploit these things that are still working, but adaptive enough to say, hey, those things that used to work, not so much. Stop. And then these things that we were prototyping, we should now add and then continuing to look for other things that are additive in nature. So things that we can research, things that we can then study in detail and then make decisions about what to add until it becomes part of that body of knowledge. So this is part of that lifelong journey. Um, and now I want to hat tip, I think, uh, Dan Stewart who talks about the 25-year 20, the, the plan, which changed his life. And he said that one of the things that he learned was that every day to write down what it was that he wanted out of life. What do I want to achieve that will still be something that I want 25 years from now? So he was looking at that, who do I want to be and where do I want to be and what do I want to have at 25 years? And then what can I do today that moves me towards that 25-year goal and committing to that in writing? And what that allowed him to do was remember that the things that are enduring in life, the things that are of value, are things that you still know you're going to want 25 years, good relationships, good businesses, good habits of mind, good character, good health, a good community. And the things that are not aligned with that 25-year plan may not be the things that I want to do in the short term. So this helps you uh, incorporate that longer-term vision and and help you remember that these little uh, these decisions that I'm making, um, these these uh, rapid frames that I'm making. Um, at, at T0 and going forward to T1, those are, those are, uh, those are fleeting, and, but there's a connectivity to them, and they're all in support of that longer period of time. So now she has enough data to work with, and now in a slow, methodical, deliberate, thoughtful, mindful manner, I want her to adopt the mentality of the craftsman. Every day I go to work, I have my little shop, I take my raw materials in there. I got my tools. I have my habits of mind. And I have the intention of constructing something from my little catalog of goods. You know, today it's the, you know, for the first year, it's just the kata or it's the SSC or just I'll make one wooden bowl. Draw the same thing every day for one year. If we think about that that art, artistic uh, adv uh, advice I talked about earlier this week. So there's a certain endurance. And what distinguishes the craftsman from the novice is the willingness to endure all that, to realize that that's not really pain at all, but that's just what it feels like when you're developing craft knowledge. And if you're willing to do it, but most other people aren't, then that's where, the, that's where your long-term persistent edge is coming from, is adopting that craft approach to knowledge. So that's what Catherine is on her way to doing, and she's well started. And so now when she studies her materials and takes a look at the lessons learned and conducts those assessments, now she has things that she can start to test one at a time and say, if I make this change, how does that work? 
the novice tries to change everything all at once or leaps to brand new patterns and hopes for beginner's luck and that this will be the magic bullet. A craftsman studies the environment and the workshop and the wood and the tool and their hands and is mindful and has calm, patient breath and just continues to march and then relies on that um, um, you know the the architecture uh, these these direct planning prop plan prepare execute assess the scaffolding and techniques these the non-negotiable risk management the construction of a safety net that is well anchored that prevents the trade as it unfolds from ever becoming a problem and certainly not becoming dangerous. And then we can make adjustments to all the patterns and habits in response to the world. And in that way, you get a steady progression up the scale, up towards expertise. Now, I'm going to save some of those for later in this week. Uh, but that's that was the lessons I wanted to talk about. We're now we're into this. So, so there's that. Uh, following those principles. But again, remember, it's more what you do and how you learn and adapt than trying to be disconnected. So that's everything I wanted to cover for tonight. Uh, while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and record the... Um, audio for these other two coffee talk charts, but um, I wanted to get the, the charts out of the way. So that's everything I have for the for the chart framing. This is more just kind of general purpose education. If you want to get back to work, you can do that. Um, so let me think here. Yeah, so uh, back to coffee talk. Uh, I want to give a hat tip to some really uh, interesting websites. Um, Farnham Street, they have a weekly email summary of really good ideas. Uh, I think it's as, it's as good as anything on the web in terms of giving you high-quality mental models and connecting to deep thinkers with lots of good references. It's strongly connected to the work of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger especially Munger, and so I think they do a nice eclectic job of pulling together interesting speakers. It's like a uh, TED Talk, but for thinkers, actual thinkers. Zero Hedge, on the other hand, is a bunch of uh, racist, right-wing, fascist knuckleheads, but I find their take on uh, the power game of money and money management and government policy to be refreshing and honest and a challenge, so I overlook the uh, alleged racism and and uh, and and, uh, and mean spirited uh, in order to get to the challenging ideas so a lot of good ideas come out of those guys um, from Farnham Street there was a, there were good connections to uh, the power of focus the Michelangelo effect um, the idea of the importance of creating time and space to do reflective thinking the notion that wisdom is earned through internal work and not received from others. So that's that's connected to the idea that it's not what the teacher teaches as much as it is what the student efforts through the internal learning processes. And um, and that connects back to the to the diagram on the teacher student and the acquisition of, of knowledge. So there was a strong connection between what they had there and some of these other things that I'm working on to the point where I wanted to write it down. There was a link in there that talked about uh, the four quadrants of conformity or conformism. So here's a hat tip to uh, Paul Graham. And uh, in Graham's world, um, he says, uh, imagine a, um, uh, a two by two matrix where you have on the horizontal axis conventional thinkers and independent thinkers. So doing the work for yourself or, you know, sort of following the status quo. It says it's not equal, and I just threw some numbers. What if it was 80, 20? And it's a continuum. It's not, uh, it's not pure clean. Um, and then on the vertical axis, it would be um, uh, 
are you passive or aggressive? And again, I said it was more people are passive than aggressive. So imagine if you had something like 80% of the folks were generally passive and 20 were aggressive and 80% were conventional thinkers and 20% were independent. You do the math and you'd have something like in a population of 100, you might have 64 what we could think of as sheep, uh, not in a bad way, but just passively conforming conformist uh, thinking um, my, whoops my my little uh, wrist monitor was beeping it wanted some battery juice uh, and then you might have um, these aggressive conventional thinkers he put in terms of uh, kids in school young kids you see, those would be the tattletales and uh, who were aggressively reporting the kids who weren't following the rules of conventional thinking. They're uh, trying to aggressively make other people conform. Uh, and then you might have 16 dreamers, if you call them the uh, passive independent thinkers, they are off, you know, off the beaten path, but they're not doing anything about it. They are content to kind of imagine those different worlds. And then aggressive independent thinkers, he called them the naughty kids. And so there was a nice thoughtful discussion at his website, Paul Graham. Um, and he made the following points that, first of all, you got to protect the independent thinkers because that's the source of all new ideas. The conventional thinkers uh, do not come up with any new ideas. So any new ideas that you're ever going to see are coming from the independent thinkers. And so they need to be protected so that they continue to come up with the new ideas. Um, he also said, uh, well, you shouldn't stifle bad ideas. And he went through a discussion of why. And my takeaway was that um, when you are on the cutting edge out here, and I'm going to refer to that same uh, diagram picture that I used before that was similar to this, that uh, you have something like the world has moved on this black circle, the world, and then the conventional wisdom is this blue circle, and it is lagging the adaptive world by some degree because the status quo is slow, but it's out here on the cutting edge where new ideas and new opportunities are being created by these very people that are doing the independent thinking. For me as a trader and a practical guy with my second mouse strategy, I'm just saying, is there some reliable way to exploit the possibilities inherent here without suffering too much the consequences of failure? Because this is where you expect new ideas to fail. New ideas fail so often, that's why the status quo has power, is because the new ideas fail so much, but not always. And any change in the world is coming from those few new ideas that actually pay off. And the people who put those into action are the naughty kids. And so you've got to protect them even when their ideas are bad, because otherwise you lose the population of people who are trying new ideas, but who are also willing to put them into action and test it. So now to protect the naughty kids, we need some protected way for them to explore that space, but safely. And so to me, that gets back to this idea here that we saw, which was the idea of reliably exploiting opportunities to gain rewards in view of the danger is this whole notion of risk management, safety net, scaffolding, and all of these supporting processes that allow us to reliably be second mice and to get across the bridge. And that if we can do that enough, we can gain expertise in doing exactly that. We don't have to wait for the luck of genius and pick which genius it is that, no, we can do something to innovate, which is to take un, unvarnished creativity and opportunity and yet somehow reliably get the reward based on the things that we've learned about how the world works, which means that we've got to respect the bodies of knowledge, but like these experts over here, know when to vary and when to go beyond the limits of that validated professional knowledge. So we've got to have um, um, 
Do I still have it in there? Yeah, this this idea of what to drop, what to keep, what to increase, what to add, that management of that body of knowledge is what allows us to be those second mice. Okay. Now, when you're if you think about this and sort out where you are on that quadrant, it's also fair to say it wasn't covered in his little blog posting, because you can't cover everything. But you should also remember that what matters is which rules are the ones that are being flouted or being uh, conformed to, and what age and population are we really talking about? And then what's the context of how important is it? How fundamental is it? What are the consequences of nonconformity, and what are the payoffs? So there's some risk reward that goes through all of this, and so. The idea of when to conform and who conforms and under what conditions and what should you do does matter according to these different contextual points, which is exactly what um, uh, what we know from Dr. Herr when he talked about the difference between experts and novices were this understanding of meaningful patterns, organized content knowledge, appreciating circumstance and context, and flexible retrieval of situational models. That's what I argue is represented in our scaffolding and our processes and the ability to construct safety nets to do reasonable risk management to avoid problems and danger and somewhat reliably get the rewards that we envision. And that the things that we do as we gain expertise in our techniques or in as you gain expertise in your technique, that's what actually matters more for results than any set of conventional wisdom, rules, and principles and lessons, which would tell you, hey, day trading is not even possible, but which I would tell you, uh, I believe it's the safest form of trading because it has the most manageable, uh, manageable risk. Um, and gives you the quickest feedback about what's working and what's not. So I look at it as low risk, but that's not what the conventional wisdom would be. So I don't care about the conventional wisdom in the sense. That, so, and I'm taking action on it. So I guess in this quadrant, I would be a naughty person. So be it. Uh, there's a really nice article that came out of the uh, Farnham Street from bencoon.net about the importance of being impatient. It was so good I had my daughter read it while we were waiting for dinner tonight. He makes the argument that accelerated trial and error is really important because it drives you to be relentlessly prioritizing about the things that are most important. And that when you combine this urge to find a critical path, what's the minimum amount of things that I got to do to be successful? I would call that the kata approach. Kata, number one, support of spring crossing is the my current favorite for the critical path to be trading effectively quickly with the minimum amount of supporting knowledge. We can add that other stuff later once we're making money with kata number one. And then the idea of the critical path, think of it as completing the circuit, that when you do all of the things that are needed and it's connected, did, and did the light turn on when you flip the switch? If so, then you have, a, you have a pathway from switch to light bulb. And if you can do that in the fewest steps, then you've completed the circuit, turned on the light, and you found the critical path. So when you apply this kind of urgency and hurry up to every little thing that you're doing, you get some little incremental micro advantage on every one of the transactions by doing things important quickly and then studying it. And then you can actually do test driven development because you're getting rapid feedback. Well, if you have those habits of mind, you're going to start accumulating those little micro advantages. You're going to make and reinforce connections between things that work and you can start putting modules together into concepts, into packages, into systems and strategies, which is the same way that neural networks work, which is uh, forges new pathways, reinforces the ones that are working and prunes the other ones. And this gets you into test driven development. And if you can do it faster, then you've discovered what Boyd discovered 
uh, Colonel John Boyd, the fighter pilot, in his OODA loop, where you ob observe, orient, decide, and act. That little loop of decision making is what he says uh, fighter pilots and executives do. And if you can operate that cycle faster than the other guy, then you get a competitive advantage because you're um, adapting faster than him. You're in his blind spot all the time, and that's actually a very safe place to be. So when you put all of those things together, um, betting against the conventional wisdom, well, if you're wrong, people say, oh, well, you're, you're a fool. If you're right, you're a genius and you get an enormous payoff. So how can you tilt the odds in, the, in your favor to know under what conditions should you bet against the conventional wisdom? So being selectively naughty, which is being willing to put it into action. I would change aggressive into action. Takes into account what rules, what age, what context, what consequences, when to bet against the conventional wisdom. For me, that supported spring crossing is an example of that, where or a Z3 excursion that has started to reverse. The conventional wisdom is everything's down. Everybody's on that side of the trade. Well, the second mouse then says, well, I've just observed the first mouse put that first leg in that met the conditions that I can now, under measured conditions, start incrementing into that position. So just remember that when the world starts moving away from the conventional wisdom, there's some conventional wisdom that still is valuable. And that feel, when the conventional wisdom is still working with this modern adaptive world, everything feels smooth because you've ground off all the rough edges. It's a finely tuned machine. But at some point, the world will have moved far enough that if this isn't adaptive, it's going to join the ranks of the conventional wisdom that's no longer in alignment with the world as it is. And then in this area are where things become obsolete or start to not work as much. That's the trailing edge of that. So if there's opportunity on the cutting edge, there's actually opportunity on the trailing edge to be short those things that are no longer working, like shorting buggy whip manufacturers when in when automobiles start becoming the next biggest thing. Well, that's where the, you know, like you want to be short three and a half inch floppy disk manufacturers because they ain't gonna, that's not going to happen anymore. So conventional wisdom always lags. The status quo always lags the cutting edge to some degree. So we might ask, what's the rate of change between the world and the ability of the status quo to update? How fast are the new things being incorporated? Is the status quo expanding or contracting? Is it a stable environment or is it characterized by VUCA and how do you measure that? Just a hat tip to uh, the Dreyfus brothers, Hubert and Stuart Hubert was a philosopher, a phenomenologist who was concerned about how people experience the world from inside their head, not from a top-down derivative analytical nature, but what was it like to be that kind of a person? So he was prioritizing the lived experience, and so that whole body of psychological knowledge is called phenomenology, and he was one of the early phenomenologists. And he was concerned with the acquisition and development of mastery. His book, Mind Over Machine, is on the way. I'm going to read it. It was co-written with his brother, Stuart, who was an industrial engineer, uh, professor, and also an operations research systems anal analyst in ORSA. That's the quant guys. So they came up with this model of skill acquisition, which felt familiar to me as soon as I saw it. Um, they talk about a progression of novice to advanced beginner to competent to proficient to expert. In their book, Mind Over Machine, they, they called that like mastery, but there's like that five-step layer. And they said there were four binary qualities that have to do with skill acquisition that gave each one of these guys a characteristic set of qualities. Like the novice, unlike all of the other guys, has non-situational recollection of facts. In other words, they uh, try to recall facts and lists and steps and checklist, regardless of the situation that they find themselves in. So they just immediately revert to the checklist or the list of principles without taking into consideration any of the situational factors. But 
even the advanced beginner already recognizes that the factors in the situation matter as to which of the checklists or principles you should recall and apply. So, and everybody after that also is using situational recall of crucial knowledge. They then said the next one is recognition. Um, so the novice and the advanced beginner are still are decomposing that recognition. In other words, they are trying to isolate pieces of the situation or the environment in order to match their pattern. So they're disregarding large portions of the environment in order to, let's say, um, focus on just a few areas where they do feel competent. So they have decomposed recognition down to just a few items, whereas the competent, proficient, and expert are using more of a holistic recognition of patterns that they look at uh, a complex situation as complex. The decomposition is an approach that tries to make things even simpler than possible, but it, or maybe too simple. Um, and so once you start adopting a holistic view is probably when you can start thinking about level three competence. Uh, decision making of the novice, advanced beginner, and, and competent person tend to be analytical in that they do like that rational utility model where you break things down into component pieces, try to put numbers on them, do a weighted matrix, come up with some numbers-based analytical, purely rational, logical approach, which emphasizes on explicit and formal knowledge. At the level of proficiency and expertise, however, you see the introduction of intuitive knowledge and intuitive decision-making in which they are trusting the gut and not just the mind. And so we will recall that um, the, the knowledge of intuition is not just random guessing, but really it is the internalized reflect, reflective learning and the accumulated adaptive experiential learning, which realizes the holistic multivariable nature of the world and allows us to recall those things, that flexible retrieval of situationally important knowledge that appreciates context and circumstances, that doesn't try to put everything into an infinite series of if-then rules and black and white dichotomies, but says, no, there's some holistic review of the world that gives us insight. So that's what they meant by this intuitive uh, decision making. And then awareness is that the novice up through the proficient are operating from a conscious mentality of they are monitoring what they're doing. So part of themselves is watching what they're doing, that there is separation between them and the task activity. It's that conscious competence model. And it's only when you get up into the expert level or what they call level five expertise that you become so absorbed and in the flow that there's no separation between you and who you are and what it is that you're doing, that you become absorbed. So we can say then that the difference to the Dreyfus brothers between an expert and a novice is that whereas the novice is looking at isolated facts and tries to break things down into into the simplest little pieces of the environment that they can recognize and work with so that they can be analytical about that little snapshot or sample, and then they watch themselves going through it to make sure they're not making mistakes, they're not totally immersed, whereas the expert, by the time they've gotten up into here, are very <clears throat> situationally informed about what they are recalling, that they let the situation pull from them the knowledge that's already on board as needed and that they trust that happens that they have a holistic view of things so that they're looking at not just the most apparent things but even at the deep subtle things and they're trying to get that holistic picture from multiple perspectives the way an expert golfer walks around the hole to get his read of the green and that the decision making they make is based on that intuitive feel of correctness and rightness that satisfies all of those outliers and that then they become fully absorbed in that whole process that doesn't draw a distinction between 
you know, prepare and execute, that they are fully in, in absorbed and, and focused on um, the important things, um, as opposed to being distracted by the trivial many. But it is focused, active behavior. So if we take a look at this mental space in here, the power of the um, uh, of focus was the ability to not aim at those other things. But what do you do when you're not focused? Are you actively trying to multitask and fill in your head with social media trivia? Or are you laying, allowing this to lie fallow and to do that kind of reflective learning that allows you to pull together different pieces, like I've been trying to demonstrate here, that builds some of that deep, intuitive, holistic, situational knowledge that you can then draw upon when you're in an area of focus, then those things become available to you. And that's what um, they were talking about, that selective recall of contextually important information is because you've made all those connections in your reflective uh, ex uh, learning out here. So you can think of Kanban as a way to select of all the things you're going to do to focus on just limiting the work in process and then focusing hard on that and being mindfully aware of all these different elements and these different qualities and where you are. That productive boredom is what Maria Konnikova talked about in her YouTube videos. Um, that is, you have to have some period of um, daydreaming and connectivity and um, um, not purposeful focused activity, but the ability to draw those underlying connections. Um, sitting quietly doing nothing. You have to actually learn to do that, that you have to reduce those exposures to social media and other attention traps, which suck away the time, energy, and space of doing the deep connectivity that's needed to really generate this expert situational holistic knowledge. And what the problem with that is the dopamine effect of multitasking and social media. It feels like we're doing things, but we're not really doing anything. We're just marking time. Um, this guy, Josh Kaufman, does a nice job of helping how to make that transition into active focus, practical learning. And that's kind of what we're aiming at here. So that's the other connections that I wanted to make there. And that's what we just did here in the last 20 minutes or so was an example of this kind of connective uh, learning that that is bringing together different kinds of models of the Dreyfus brothers and uh, some of these um, some of these ideas about conformity and situations and strategies and status quo in the developing world and um, understanding VUCA. Some of these things about the the urgency to act now and what it means to bet against conventional wisdom. And when should you do it and how should you do it? Just bet against it in order to be unconventional or because it's situationally the correct time to make the good bet. So it's in the application. And then this notion of the applied um, unconventional wisdom says, yeah, day trading is not only possible, it can be rewarding, but you have to have these other professional kit in place in order to be able to seize the reward that you see in this opportunity while avoiding the danger of that particular one and then the long-term problem of taking shortcuts. What if you get so good at this that you start taking shortcuts, the illusion of expertise or not following the rules? Yeah, so there's nothing like uh, periodic reminders of how much that stuff hurts. And then just the challenges of, of teaching and learning is that really what you got to take away from this is that I can set the table, but really it's you developing expertise for a given situation driven by those results is what matters. And that the expertise from doing comes from the doing. And that as you progress up this ladder, it's more you and what you're doing and what you're doing about it that improves all of these things. And then as a coach, I can do some things to help. And so maybe early in our journey, I'm teaching just what I think you need, but I'm trying to use this gradual release of responsibility model that gets you 
more quickly into the ownership of the learning and the doing and the self-coaching and that, so that uh, you're not relying on me as uh, a source of that knowledge, but it's you constructing the knowledge from your adaptive experiential learning. And that's why you develop intuition, and it's not just random guessing. And it's not just playing the same old cards, but it's watching how that world changes. Um, it's this piece. It's watching how that world changes to leave behind the conventional wisdom. I'm going to go back and clean up my spelling. All right, guys, that's everything I wanted to cover. Uh, I see uh, Eugene made it home safely. That's good. Out there in Wyoming. Um, that's everything I got, guys. I'll get this posted and published, and, uh, and then off we go. We'll see you tomorrow. Watch for an explosion in the text. <laughs>